Megan, it's no secret that I'm a maximalist who loves luxe clothing and home goods. It's also no secret that I'm a minimalist who also loves investing in a handful of small luxe things that will last in service for a long time, especially for my house. And we both love a good deal, which is why we both become obsessed with OneQuince.com, a one-stop shop for curated luxury goods shipped direct from the world's best specialist factories. Quince partners with factories that produce well-known luxury brands and that demonstrate a commitment to high production standards, fair wages, safety, and sustainability. They also focus on essential products with low design costs. Think cashmere crews, super soft fleece pants, and the down comforters and hotel quality sheets that I stocked up on for my new house. I've also been doing some back-to-school shopping to stock up on fall essentials for me. <laughs> a new denim shirt, everyday gold hoop earrings, and a super cute crossbody bag. Staples are wear on repeat all season, shipped directly from the factory, no middle person, no upcharge. Altogether, that's how Quince is able to keep prices up to 50 to 80% lower than other brands. Real Simple, In Style, Fast Company, Refinery29, and Fortune all agree with us. Quince is a game changer. Take advantage of a brand new offer just for our listeners. Get 10% off any purchase of $100 or more with the code FEED10. There's always free shipping and 365 day returns. Just go to onequince.com slash D-I-J-F-Y. That's O-N-E-Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash D-I-J-F-Y, short for didn't I just feed you. Quality shouldn't be a luxury. Try Quince today. Educate them because they're getting their education from places that are not reliable and don't really know what they're talking about. And if you have even a little bit more information, then that can really serve them well. Welcome to Didn't I Just Feed You, a podcast about feeding kids. Hi, I'm Stacy, And I'm Megan. Hey, before we jump into today's conversation, we want to take a second to encourage you to join our Didn't I Just Feed You community. Yes, Megan, talk to the people. I am talking. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> because I want to make sure that everyone knows that there's a free listeners group and to join, all you need to do is share your email address. It's honestly just like when we were on Facebook. It's true, you guys. We ask for your email there too. It doesn't go to any big company, just we keep it. And I would say it's just as easy. We'll put a link in our show notes or go to Instagram where we're at, didn't I just feed you, and find the link in our bio. Click, enter your email, and boom, you're part of our free listeners group, the coolest and most helpful place on the internet. It really is. And hey, guys, if you're able to comfortably support Didn't I Just Feed You in our efforts to publish free weekly episodes, we'd of course love to welcome you to our community as a supporting member. Also, supporting members can pledge their support monthly or annually, and they receive awesome perks if we do say so ourselves. Mm -hmm. Two exclusive episodes every month. We used to call them minis, but they're so not <laughs> minis. <laughs> they're so juicy. <laughs> Live quarterly events, lifetime access to a private Instagram feed, and a huge quarterly giveaway. The one coming up for the holidays is going to be epic. And you know how we love transparency. So just so you know, all the funds pledged by our supporting members get reinvested in growing Didn't I Just Feed You and making it as helpful and accessible a platform as possible. We're working on adding a video component, being able to provide transcripts and <laughs> launching classes a whole lot for our little team. So we need and deeply appreciate your support. Okay, so speaking of our community... We're going to move on to the topic of the day because this one has been a long time requested topic by our listeners. I mean, honestly, we probably should have broached this a million years ago, <laughs> but I'm in it so deep and it's such a personal topic that I kept kind of getting turned around. And then Megan was like, Billis, we, got, we just got to do this. We're going to jump in and talk about feeding teenagers. Yay! <laughs> I'm excited to talk about this because Ella is nine. Okay, she's she'll be 10 in January, right? Um, she's my oldest, so she's the one who I experience all the first with. Yeah. And even though she's not quite a tween, though she seems excited to be, <laughs> um, <laughs> we're already like experiencing the push and pull of her growing autonomy 
and my growing concerns about <laughs> her nutrition. Um, so we're going to touch on a lot today and our thoughts that come up here in this conversation and how people respond to this episode. We can dig deeper into different areas. Yes, I do feel like we needed to start by taking the 10,000 foot view, as they say. It's just such a huge topic. But I felt like everything that our guest Bracha said, I had like a thousand other questions to ask in like a million directions. So I'm just super excited that we are just starting with this broad overview. We have an amazing guest. We were thrilled to invite on Bracha Kopstick today. She's a registered dietitian who specializes in adolescent nutrition. And what she says is that she helps parents feel calm and confident raising tweens and teens to have a positive relationship with food and their body. That's so, a big promise. Wow. <laughs> Oh, wow. I guess she's basically a superhero. Um, but Bracha also says, you know, there's a lot of contradictory information about feeding kids. And her goal is to clarify and educate parents so that they can raise adolescents with a positive relationship with food, free of shame and guilt. She believes that by addressing nutritional messaging at this stage of growth, adolescents can learn to eat free of guilt and shame, grow into mature adults with interests that go beyond food and their appearance. Yes. Right? I mean, could we have someone better on to start us off? I don't think so. I have a strong sense that there'll be many more episodes about feeding teens that kind of drill deeper into different issues because there are so many of them. But I think that I want to start by just taking a breath <laughs> and talk to you about the fact that feeding teens just feels so high stakes. Can you just kind of, this is very unlike me in other interviews, but can you just kind of start us off by setting some intentions or some goalposts? I know that a lot of other parents of teens just feel very overwhelmed because, you know, there's social media and there's body image and there's, are they eating enough and they're growing and we're not in control anymore. Just so much to process. Yeah, it is really big. And like you're saying that overwhelm is, is really scary because it does seem like there's so much going on and like they're practically adults and they're going to be eating independently any minute, you know, off on their own. And there is so much of that development that they're going through and they need to be eating well to be, uh, to be fueling that growth and their development and their brain is in the process of changing and uh, their friends have so much more of um, influence on them and they're slowly leaving home. I think one thing that perhaps can be often overlooked is that parents do have still a very big role in how their kids are eating. And kids might not show that they want that, in, that input, but they really still need it. They're, they're not quite as independent yet as they often let themselves seem or as we kind of think that they are. So I hope today we can kind of discuss some of that areas where parents can be involved more than they think they can be yes. to, to really help their, their teenagers, their tweens to, um, to be able to transition from children into independent adults. I really appreciate that. I do also have to say, that if you had told me, and parents have more control, talking about even my 11 year old, but when they're seven, eight, nine, I'd be like, great. Like, I love having control. <laughs> but there's something about having control with a teenager that's actually a little bit scary because, again, the stakes feel so high. I'm afraid that when I try to, like, not exercise control over what he eats. But when I try to like exercise some of my influence, I feel like maybe I'm doing it wrong. I think that something that parents in general don't talk a lot about, I used to talk about this in the context of picky eating with younger kids, but it's so difficult not to project your own issues onto how you feed your children right? Like that's where we're coming from. We're coming from our own relationship with food. And when you can just manage what you put on the table and what your kid eats and what your kid has access to, 
you know, if you're aware of that, you can kind of override it and, you know, make decisions that you feel like are the right ones. But when Isaac is my 14 year old, when he's out and he tells me what he's eaten and I feel anxious because I feel like it's not enough or it isn't nourishing, it's hard not for that to not come through in our communication. I mean, and that's another aspect of it, right? Like I actually have full conversations with my kids where I'm not just like planning the conversation and presenting and then going into my room and like crying or being anxious. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. He's a real person. Like he's a yes. grown up. Like it, it shows he can tell he can read between the lines of how I feel. It's, it's intimidating. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Because they are getting a lot of information from other places yeah. and it's not at this point anymore just from you. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's what so I There is a back that. and forth for sure. Okay. So then talk to us about where can we influence our kids and how should we? I mean, I can give you a couple of examples, concrete examples we can work off of from my experience. One is that I don't feel like Isaac eats enough, period. And he's super thin and that shouldn't even be a factor, but that's my own issues, right? Coming in, like thinking about weight in relationship to health and not being able to separate that. So like, there's an example when he, I don't feel like he's eating enough to nourish him. Like how, like, what can I do? So first off, you know, if you want to, the weight is an issue and you are concerned about that, I would suggest, you know, going to the doctor and, or, you know, monitoring their weight to a certain extent, you know, those yearly check-ins when they get their height and their weight, are they following their growth trajectory? Okay. So that can be just like, first off, a way to kind of reassure yourself that, their growth is appropriate and, and yep. following their own personal needs. That would be first off. And then when it comes to eating enough or eating the right amount for themselves, if, if your teen, your tween is eating frequently, if they're able to get a variety of food, and we're talking over the course of a week or so, it's not mm. day to day, it's not meal to meal. Like if you're focusing on each meal and each eating opportunity, yes, you're definitely going to stress about what's involved in that. If you're able to look at it a bit more of uh, an over, uh, like a wider spectrum of their overall eating, that is often a better gauge of what they're eating and the amounts they're eating. So if you are confident that your teen, your tween is eating frequently, they're eating meals, they're eating snacks, there is some bit of variety in each of those even if it doesn't seem the right amount to you, they very likely are getting enough for what they need. If, they, if, they're, if they're eating in a way that respects their body's needs, so like you know, not being pushed to eat more, not being dieting, not feeling like you need to restrict food. So if they are eating to their hunger, to their fullness levels, you can generally be reassured that they are eating appropriately. I really love that. I feel like that's advice my pediatrician gave me when my kids are really little, like just looking at the whole week and not looking at a single day. But I think especially being the mother of a daughter and having some like disordered eating within our family, um, I'm super curious if there are warning signs that are like not just about the volume of food that kids are eating or like what they're choosing to eat that parents can kind of be looking for because we know that our kids are being influenced by social media and by their friends and by magazines like we're not controlling all the media that they consume and they might not talk to us about like wanting to be more fit or wanting to be thinner and they might be making food choices that are not tied to like what we think we've taught them. So what are some like warning signs of disordered eating in teens? I would say if you've noticed them cutting down on their sweets intake, so they're no longer eating candy or cookies. Um, They've gotten really into eating fruits and vegetables and proteins. Those are usually the, the quote unquote healthy foods that teens gravitate to when they're trying to make a change. Um, you might hear the way they talk about food, even about it being healthy or junk food. 
really focusing on on those categories and um and and how they are or are not or are their friends even are or are not eating those sort of foods i've also seen kids really starting to wanting to exercise more uh that often is a sign um that they're kind of getting overly invested in their in their health or their quote unquote health there's other things you mean cutting meals or finding excuses not to join you in eating, sneakiness, anxiety around meals and food. There are kind of a lot of things that kind of can clue you into their mind frame around food and eating. Well, I think that this confirms that Isaac does not have issues. (laughs) (laughs) okay (laughs) if that's all you were looking for stacy we nailed it (laughs) all he eats is junk food and (laughs) zero interest in exercising outside of practice okay (laughs) i also had the thought when we were talking earlier part of my anxiety comes from a weird eating pattern and i've shared this with our listeners in our listeners group and it seems like there are a bunch of teenagers who have this pattern where He barely wants breakfast. I try to just get him to eat something small and he gets that. Like, I know it feels like I'm forcing him, but I'm like, even just a bite, I don't care what it is, like a cupcake and like just eat something because you're going into the day. I mean, obviously cupcakes, not ideal, but I'm more comfortable with that than nothing. And then I have no idea what he does at lunch. It's very dependent on what's available. Like Isaac is very much someone who, if what's at the cafeteria is gross or not what he feels like, he just won't really eat or he'll grab a salad and whatever. If it's something good, like yesterday they had breakfast for lunch, French toast sticks, he, I'm sure, ate plenty. Then at dinner, then he comes home and he snacks voraciously, obviously. So then at dinner, he's not as hungry because we eat a little early. And then at 11 o'clock at night, without fail, he's starving. And he's pretty good about leaving his dinner. Like if he hasn't finished dinner, he'll start with his dinner. But often it's just like snack-tastic voyage, like well into the late night. (laughs) Like that's his pattern. So it seems kind of heavy on the like afternoon and evening. Is this, I don't want to use the word normal because I know there's so much variation, but are these kinds of eating patterns that might seem erratic to us when we're so used to feeding our little ones like breakfast, lunch, dinner, two snacks. Is that normal? So this is a bit of a shift in the teen body um, hormones and, and composition that they do have a later wake up uh, activation time. So it yeah. is, uh, you know, we see them going to sleep later um, we see them make it, being harder to wake up. That's the, the body is kind of shifting towards a later running time almost. Mm-hmm. So this does make sense that you're seeing this and that a lot of your listeners are also seeing this with their teens and tweens. At the same time, we, we know that with when you don't eat a lot or enough during the day, you do need to make up for it at the end of the day. So yes, it's natural. And we can also kind of shift away from that if kids are able to eat more or better during the day as well. Do you have tips for yeah. persuading them? To <laughs> Here we go. That. Back to the influence yes. and what we can do. Will you yes. talk to us about that? Well, I mean, like what you're saying for breakfast, getting them to eat something, great point. If you can, you know, if they're if they're open to that and finding something that they're able to eat, even if yes, it's a cupcake even if it is something that you wouldn't necessarily think of as breakfast food. And then encouraging those snacks during the day. So, you know, even from breakfast to lunch, that might be quite a large gap of time. Do they have time in school that they can eat a snack? Do they have time between lunch and home that they can get in something else that they're eating or something else to eat? Um, Even what they're snacking on at home, Uh, Like you say, he's just snacking the whole time he's home before dinner. Can you make that snacking times like a more concrete timing? So for say 15 to 30 minutes or so, we're eating and then there's a break, then there's dinner and he can actually eat dinner and get something really nourishing and filling during that time. 
and then yeah. doing that same at that kind of pre bedtime eating as well to have more of a standardized time to eat his snacks rather than just eating throughout the night. It's funny. It's kind of a return to some of the stuff that you do when you're trying to get, you know, I remember these phases from like first foods to toddler and then, you know, from small toddler to big toddler and they like drop a snack or they drop a bottle or breastfeed. And they were always advising parents to like, okay, like follow their lead but also let's put some boundaries up. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like this is when we eat and these are your options, but then you decide like how much and you know, what and how much. So it's funny to like have to return to that, but I'm trying to return to that with a new headspace that also respects his boundaries and natural cycles, which are like completely unfamiliar to me <laughs> right now. <laughs> Yes. It's wild. Yes. It also reminds me of, a, we had a past guest talk about picky eating. And really at the time we were talking about elementary age kids, but she was saying one thing that she did was shift dinner time to after school snack time. So she could get like the bulk of the nutrition into her little kids before like bath time, you know, bedtime routine started, and then also offered a bedtime snack. I'm so curious, Stacey, because I feel like I don't, I know Isaac in as much as you've described him and the times that I've met him, but I, he's such a strong personality. If you were like, we're having dinner at 4.30, or even if you were <laughs> like, here are some backpack snacks or locker snacks, or here's cash. I just, I don't care what you eat. Please eat more throughout the day. Do you think that he would do that? I really don't know. He's like a little bit of a wild card. He's a very, very extremely independent thinker. I've had moments of parenting him where I've been like, I know I'm making a difference, but like, pfft, like this kid's just going to do what he wants. Like I'm here to facilitate him getting to adulthood. He's yes. like, can you just like cover the basics? Cause I got stuff to do places to be in life. <laughs> like I'm just here <laughs> to facilitate. I really don't know, but I can tell you that what has worked for us is really just eating convenient for him. And sometimes I feel like we've had these moments where I've been like, mm, I don't know, I feel like a little disrespected. Like, that's my cash you're spending. Or like, you know, Uber Eats shows up at my door. I'm like, whose money, oh. you know, but I can deal with those things and put boundaries around those and let him know that like, yes, like what do you want these convenience foods that are single use plastics and cost a lot more money, but it's cheese already cut up? Fine. Like, I'll do that. Like, do you need a little cash to go on a break? And instead of just drinking a matcha latte, like also get a piece of fruit or a croissant or anything. So I do think that making things as convenient as within our means is helpful. Yeah. Can we talk about social media? And yeah, teams? please. Okay. I mean, I have no expertise here, but I feel like, you know, as a 37 year old mom, I get on Instagram or the kids are probably more into TikTok. Uh, <laughs> and they, they, you know, not even people promoting weight loss, although that comes up on people's explore pages, yeah. but like the images of like, it's mostly then women dancing, making TikTok videos. And like, how is there a way that we can like influence our teens by sharing other accounts that are like positive food influences or po positive body image influencers? I, I'm just so lost as to how to set better boundaries around social media mm -hmm. as an in. Yeah. So like you said, sharing those accounts I think I've seen kids, the kids and teens who I work with, they are really open to this. Some of them are so excited about this, about being body positive, seeing people in different bodies and shapes and sizes. They are willing, I think, to see these accounts. They might not always be ready to see it for themselves. Yes. Or follow them, but they'll look. Exactly. Yeah. And that that looking is is very beneficial because the mm. more they can see someone in a different body size or shape, the more comfortable it becomes 
to recognize that people are not all one size or shape or yes. color, you know? So the more you can keep on sending those is really helpful. And what do we do when we hear our kids kind of buying into the harmful stereotypes about like body size and weight and food? You know, they roll their eyes at us, but you're saying that they're listening. So is it important to say something? It is. Yes, of course it is. They, like, what do we yeah. say? What are you saying? Exactly. So first off, talking because back to social media, talking about filters, which they know exists, but still no, like talking about that, talking about the filters, the face tuning, the posing, you know, all the magic of social media, keep reminding them that. Talk about it. Yes. About them experimenting with themselves, not using those Photoshopping or the filters to, because what I find is when we get used to seeing ourselves with those mm -hmm. filters, it gets really uncomfortable seeing ourselves in real life. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, talk to them about that. Talk about who are these people giving them this health advice, this food advice. You know, this is a 14 year old girl who decided that she wants to eat peppers instead of bread. Like, Yes. She doesn't know what she's talking <laughs> about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So talking about food and what it does for us, why we need to eat certain foods, why bread is healthy, why we need to eat fat, why it's not a bad thing to eat cake or cookies or chocolate or candy or, you know, whatever food is the bad food of the day. Educate them because they're getting their education from places that are not reliable and don't really know what they're talking about. And if you have even a little bit more information, then that can really serve them well. Yeah, one of the things I've been thinking about with my, you know, almost 10 year old is how we talk to her about what reliable sources of information are not just for food and not just for diet, but like for everything. And I think that it mostly comes up in the moment when my younger son will be like, did you know that this happened? And we're like, I'm pretty sure that you got that information from a YouTuber and that's not real. Yeah. And then we do research together about like what is real and reminding that like not everything you read on the internet is actually true. And some of it's storytelling. I think kids are becoming savvy about media literacy and parents and schools too. But I do think that there is a kind of wall that kids hit when it comes to social media and themselves and their friends, where suddenly like they suspend their belief in all these things they know about how media is made. And it's like, well, she really looks like that. And all those people really were out together and I wasn't. And it just gets very personal. So finding ways to like speak broadly about media literacy, but also like Bracha, like you were saying, like to also talk about specifically like face tuning filters and how it applies to people and how they're presenting themselves on social media as well. Can we go back to junk food for a little bit, which I'm doing air quotes, junk food. I know, junk food is a funny, like we've talked about, we did a whole episode once on talking about how we feel about junk food and how we define it. And I feel like even what, two years later, Stacey, what you would say is junk food now is different than, not what you would say, but how you feel about it is maybe a little bit yeah, different. Yeah, I, I don't know, like in my heart, no, I don't think so. But I'm like learning not to, like not to impose that onto my kids. So I think the term junk food is problematic in the first place, but for the sake of having common language here for this conversation, you know, it's funny that you were saying earlier, like signs to look out for it. Your kid gets super healthy. So I have the opposite problem where, you know, I'm a recipe developer. Like, you know, I was always of the mind that like, if we're going to have cookies in the house, I'll just make them homemade. So my house wasn't restrictive, but I really didn't buy tons of like pre-packaged cakes and cookies. Megan and I have talked about this. I'm not huge on candy. So like candy is never tempting. I we love candy. <laughs> I do too. I am huge on candy. <laughs> yeah. So like I'd have ice cream and then like homemade stuff, you know, and since I'm not a huge baker, it wasn't like there was homemade stuff every day. Mm -hmm. But as my kids got older and both I learned and their appetites changed and they had access to other things they would ask. And I've tried to be like super cool about it. Like, sure. Like, 
So now in the cabinet, which just relative only to me prior, not comparing myself to anybody else, nor should anyone else compare themselves to me, like to have like Oreos and Sun Chips and Mint Milanos and ice cream bars in my kitchen right now, which I do. That's just what's in my kitchen this week. That's a change for me. And it's like, yeah, but it's around let the kids eat what they're going to eat. Like they'll regulate themselves. Okay. So my kids, well, my older kid, especially like doesn't particularly regulate himself. He loves all that food. And like I said, he'll have like half his dinner. He'll leave dinner there. He might finish it at 11. He might not. And then he goes in and eats like a whole bag of sun chips or Doritos or a whole sleeve of cookies. And it's uncomfortable to me and I keep waiting for it to regulate and I, it doesn't, and maybe it is regulated and I'm the one, it's the way I'm seeing it. That's the problem. So can you just, I guess we're going to turn this episode into a personal therapy session (laughs) for Stacey. Here we go. Therapize me. Okay. All right. (laughs) Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. We'll do this. Let's do it. Okay. So first of all, when... We see kids eating the full bag of chips or the sleeves of cookies. It often is because they are hungry. So they are filling up on food because they're just physically needing the energy. So like you said, he's leaving half his supper and going to eat these foods. So we want to kind of figure out a way to allow the kids and teens to be eating food that is filling and nourishing and also these other foods because it tastes good. It is a, it's sweet food that kids are naturally drawn to because that means it's a high energy food and the body needs high energy foods because of all their growth and development they're undergoing. So we really want to figure out a way that we can get them both eating nourishing and these and tasty foods. Yes. And what I, I like to do is going back to that kind of, like how we were talking about before, that more structured eating. So having these foods at snack, having them at dinner time, along with those more nourishing, nutritious foods, almost like eating dinner and cookies on the same plate. Oh, that's interesting. Because I was just going to say, like, how do I do that without saying things like, which I've been trying to avoid saying, finish your dinner. Mm-hmm. And then you can eat whatever you want tonight. Cause that really is how I feel like all joking about like me projecting and therapizing aside, like that really truly is how I feel. I mean, Isaac's like an active, tall, thriving kid. I'm not actually worried for his health as much as it really does make me uncomfortable that it feels like there's a massive imbalance, but yeah. if he like eats his dinner, or I'm, I'm saying dinner, but I just mean those kinds of foods that I'm serving at dinner at some point in the day, like, I don't care, like knock yourself out. Kind of wish I had the metabolism to do it. (laughs) Like I'd eat (laughs) dinner and then whatever I wanted at 11. But like, I find myself being like finished dinner and he's like, I'm not hungry right now. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, what? Okay. Like I can't force a 14 year old to eat when he's telling me he's not hungry. That seems worse. So is it really just being like, is there an enforcing element here? Like, is there a gentle way to enforce or is that just backfire? Yeah. I don't see any way to force because that Mm. really takes away that autonomy that we are trying to help kids and teens develop. We want them to be able to trust themselves to know when they've eaten enough. So I really just got to trust him. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But you do that by, I, I really am a fan of this structure because when you are when when he has access to meals and snacks uh, every few hours, so every two to four hours or so, that contain you know something with protein, some vegetables and fruit, um, some carb food, then you can feel really confident that he's eating enough and uh, a variety because you actively see that he has opportunities to eat well, to feed himself well, and to build that trust when with his body. Like in order to build that trust for to to build that, like how you'd mentioned before, that um 
that regulation, that self-regulation, it's the body needs to know that that food will be consistent Mm -hmm. and come often enough. So if we are eating every two to four hours, a good nourishing variety of food, that's when you build that trust and that knowledge that I can depend that this food is going to come. I don't need to eat the full bag of Doritos now because I'm having a little bit now and I'll have a little bit later. That's so smart. I mean, so I feel like that really speaks to providing a range of healthy snacks, making sure that there's stuff in his backpack and really like providing, even when I'm not around, providing him with opportunity and trusting that as he gets hungry, because I said it earlier, like if he doesn't like it, he won't eat it. But if I know he has something he likes on hand, I'm going to trust that he'll be hungry and eat what's in his backpack. I do have to just like caveat for all the other parents struggling with this out there. I don't know, for us, it's definitely trickier in COVID times because, you know, there's a short walk to the bus stop and then on the bus, he has to wear a mask can't pull it down. Whenever he's on campus, he has to wear a mask. So it's a little trickier these days than most, but I still think that it applies. I just kind of wanted to acknowledge that because I know that some other parents are like feeling how hard this is right now. Yeah. And I definitely am seeing that with kids in school that they, some kids are getting breaks to eat snacks. Um, other kids aren't getting any breaks and it's like, big gaps of time when they're going from lunch until they get home to finally be able to eat a a snack or something. So in that case, they will be eating more in those times because they are going for longer periods of time without, without eating. Yeah. I also just wanted to say that from the outside looking in, especially to Stacey, like if, if Isaac feels like he can go into the kitchen and eat a whole bag of Doritos and eat a whole sleeve of cookies without like getting in air quotes, trouble, or like you being upset about that. I think you've already done a really good job of laying some groundwork for trust that you're like not giving yourself enough credit for. Thank you. And you're also giving him a safe space to experiment with that, like with, with skipping meals and eating like more junky food than you would like him to. Because the truth is he's gonna go off to college or he's gonna move out And he might do that stuff if he was a great eater all the time at home. He might do that experimenting at school without any help or outside of the house without any help and have much more dire consequences. I really appreciate that. And that's so helpful because I didn't have that kind of permission. Same. I remember in high school, like sometimes have binging what I would consider binging, but like secretly in my room and trying to hide the trash of it because I grew up with a lot of diet culture and I thought I was going to get in trouble for it when I probably was really actually just hungry because my body was growing and changing. Yes. 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 I mean, that's like a really big takeaway from this conversation is that they're hungry, like body clocks are changing. Lots of stuff is shifting high energy they're hungry and they're hungry for high energy foods like that alone if we can just keep that in mind as parents that actually just brings me so much comfort because it gives a context for understanding the choices he's making instead of me getting in my head and believing that the choices he's making are about something you know just purely psychological or something that i've done or do you know what i mean it's not personal Mm -hmm. (laughs) to me And that's a really big piece of just like letting go and like letting our teams figure things out for themselves. Yes. We would be remiss if we got through this interview without also asking specifically about teen athletes. Is there special nutrition consideration if you have like a kid who's in more than one sport and has lots of practices throughout the week, they're exercising a ton purely for joy and for the socialization of it? What would you say? Yeah, for sure. They need more. They need more, like a lot more nutrition. They need more carbs. They need more protein. They just need overall more calories. So adding in more snacks, adding in um, fuel before the activity, after the activity, depending on how long the activity is, maybe they'll even need something while they're being active. Just because there is that amount of energy that they're utilizing while, again, being in this stage of growth that already needs so much extra nutrition. So yeah, kids, teenagers who are athletes, 
need to be eating a lot of food. That makes me nervous. Having older kids, <laughs> I'm like, oh, the grocery bills. All right. Before we let you go, is there anything that we didn't ask you about that you would want our listeners to know about nutrition or feeding teens or about your work? I think we, we've spoken a lot about food and eating. And I know a lot of people get hung up on the what they're actually eating and is it healthy? Is it not healthy? Is it nourishing them? And really, I believe that it's so important is how kids and teens feel about the food they're eating. When we are able to mm. give kids and teens the opportunity to eat with out feeling guilt or shame mm, yes. or negative emotions from eating. That's really the so important, the, the biggest part of, of eating because no matter what they're eating, you know, eating is part of our life and we shouldn't have to feel negative emotions from doing that. So if we're able to keep the environment around food as a neutral environment or even, you know, if we're able to get the positive, that's awesome. But even just keeping it really neutral is such a gift to our teens that really can help them for, for the rest of their life. Yes, we love that. We talk so much about family dinners and how we want and bringing food joy back to eating as parents too. But to rem uh, remember that teens need that too is so food important. Food joy. Love food it. Joy. Yes. Good joy. Bracha, thank you so, so much for coming on. That's been my pleasure. So helpful. <laughs> You're putting many parents at ease. <laughs> I love all of Rocco's advice. I feel like you've been talking a little bit about this recently on your Instagram, but there's definitely like some alignment in advice about like feeding toddlers and even feeding babies. Like when I was breastfeeding, my pediatrician gave me the best advice, which was to look at the whole week and not just like days here yes. and there. So there's so much like uh, alignment between toddlers, little feeding little kids and feeding teens. Yeah. It's so interesting to me because Isaac was not a picky eater. Yeah. Like, ever. He was dreamy. I really like probably owe a lot of my uh, early career confidence to him. <laughs> Look what a wonderful job I've done, how far they fall. Um, <laughs> but he really wasn't a picky eater. Of course, there are exceptions. But generally speaking, a lot of times picky eating phases, when they aren't chronic, when they aren't related to sensory issues or other developmental challenges, it's really about kind of power and autonomy and the things that you were talking about earlier when you were, Megan, talking about Ella. And I feel like all that stuff comes back up again yes. when they transition to teenagehood. Who gets to be in control? Who says what's good and what's bad food? Like, this is my body. You can't tell me what to do with it. Like, there's so many parallels in what's happening developmentally. So it makes sense that there would also be these parallels and how those play out around food and eating. Yes. It just feels like the stakes are higher because these teenagers also have access to Instagram. And, and a lot of them have their own money. And so they have the means yeah. to make choice, their own choices about, you know, what they eat, whether it's like fast food or they want to get into supplements or something that maybe doesn't yeah. align with your personal values. Totally. And yeah. like even, you know, Isaac called me the other day and he was like, oh, I'm going to just go to the gym because a couple of his friends wanted to go work out after school. Well, side note, when I called him later, I was like, are you working out? He's like, no, why would I work out? It looks hard. <laughs> <laughs> he was just like, I'm just bouncing on the bouncy ball while they work out. Yeah. So anyway, that's a, that's an aside, but like, oh, like he's with kids who are working out. Like do 14 year olds know how to work out safely? And like, what yeah. are they doing and what's their goal and why? There were just so many questions in that for me. Also, questions you feel like you can't ask. I feel like I get snappy, snappy responses from Ella <laughs> sometimes, even when I'm like, oh, did, did you not enjoy lunch today? 
because it came back like pretty much exactly how I packed it. <laughs> What's the response? Oh, so many things where it's like, well, mom. Yeah. 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 It's hard. So, you know, I do think that it's helpful if you're a parent of a teen to just remember what worked because there really is, I mean, we say this all the time. We had done a whole series on picky eating back when we first launched two and a half, three years ago. And we've always said this, there's no one size fits all solutions. So, you know, parents jog your memories. What worked before? What do you think would work now? Trying different things, being patient, and then remembering that all of this is normal. I appreciated that Braha gave us a couple of things to look for, red flags, and like yeah. outside of that, you have your pediatrician to consult to. Don't worry to your kid. Don't make it dramatic. And just remember that this is normal. Yes. And parents of toddlers, man, keep notes. That's all I got to say to you. Yes. The things that were <laughs> when they were little are going to come <laughs> back to save That's you. That's right. Write older. a playbook. You're going to need it. My favorite takeaway was, well, there were two. One, the thing of we have to remember again at many phases in feeding our kids that sometimes they're, they are genuinely actually hungry. Yeah. When they want to eat that bag of Doritos, or that sleep of Oreos, it is because they are hungry. And we like expect it when they're a little bit younger and we're like expecting that to have growth spurts and we're really tracking that stuff. But as they get into their teen years, we're less aware of their growth and when they might be having a growth spurt because we're not dressing them every day, right? So we're yes. not like expecting it. Um, so I love just like sometimes they're just just hungry. But also, and this is the other takeaway for me is, and we talk about this with picky eating. We talk about this with getting our kids to eat more vegetables. We talk about this with like school lunch troubleshooting. You have to make whatever it is delicious. Like if you're yes. trying to <laughs> serve them plain chicken and veggies and wondering why they're not eating at dinner, but then they want to eat the tasty, like fiery hot Takis when they're out with their friends it's because that's a taste delicious. So you have to lean back on the like bag of tricks that you know for making food delicious, like sauces and spices. Yes. And different cooking methods. Season your food. <laughs> Season your food. I love sauces. Yeah, it's true. You know, I wonder if there's, I'm totally making this up, but I wonder if there's a connection between development in the early teen years, tween and teen years, and like taste bud sensitivity. Because yes. you know how that's a thing when they're little? Yeah. That'd be really interesting. But definitely like the development and the reinforcement, especially as they eat like cafeteria food and they're out with their friends, the reinforcement of that craving for salt and sugar yes. that we all have and that is very human. You know, and that doesn't mean you have to like lean into it completely. Like I, if you follow me on Instagram, you know that my son recently had a Crunchwrap Supreme at Taco Bell and I recreated it at home and he was like, it's good, but it wasn't as flavorful to him as Taco Bell. Yeah. It probably was not nearly as salty. Probably and not. Greasy. Yeah. And so like, but like there was a reason why I made it homemade instead of ordering it from Taco Bell. I felt like yeah. it was healthier. I could control the ingredients. And yeah, of course, also teenagers are going to always want to stick it to you. So there was a little bit of that, I'm sure. Yes. Right. So you don't have to lean into it in a way that makes you uncomfortable. But like still, he ate that more than he would have eaten like a simply grilled piece of chicken. You know what right. I mean? So like make what they like make it good right That's, yeah we have a lot of episodes to help you make it good <laughs> is that a tall order is that a i'm also thinking thing you say? know uh, my mind starts going okay well like if he loves a crunch wrap why not like a giant taco nacho salad and then you can put cheese sauce on it totally and like when have we not solved <laughs> some kind of dilemma <laughs> without putting cheese on it <laughs> cheese sauce. And you know, I actually made, and we'll include the link in the show notes. I made a new cheese sauce recipe. So I was like, I had a lot of things going that day and I can make cheese sauce just like, yeah, I don't a follow recipe. a recipe. 
I started with a roux and it got a little too brown for a cheese sauce in my humble opinion. And then like, I wasn't paying attention and then basically it broke. Mm. And I was like, oh, I could fix this, but I don't feel like deal. Like this is a, for a Crunchwrap Supreme at home. Yes, like I, I'm yes. not going to like, so I just like very quickly was like nacho cheese sauce recipe, like just to see if there was one that I could make really quickly. And I found a recipe that I'd never seen before by J. Kenji Lopez Alt at Serious Eats. Yes. Where basically all you do is you toss some shredded cheese with cornstarch just to coat it, right? Mm -hmm. And then you melt it with evaporated milk. That's yeah. it. A little bit of hot sauce. I'd never done that before. It's like the jar of que like of queso cheese sauce. In, it, a, in the best way. Like I'm listening to you talk about me. I'm we'll make cheese sauce on a weeknight too, but for a crunch wrap supreme, because there's so many components, that's one where I would totally just like buy the best quality jar I could. <laughs> I should I love that you made it. Well, because it just, Good on I don't you, know, Phyllis. the jar the jars of cheese. I've never purchased a jar of cheese sauce. <laughs> Okay, well, <laughs> we'll get you there. We got you buying frozen chicken nuggets. That's Those true. who follow our private community, Finsta, know yes. that Stacy, who said she'd never bought chicken nuggets in her life, has made her favorite, a recent purchase of frozen chicken nuggets and now has a favorite that she's eating for lunch on the regular. Yeah, so mm -hmm. the cauliflower ones are mine. And then I bought the Bell and Evan ones to make chicken and waffles as a teen yes. breakfast. Which, by the way, kind of worked. But anyway, yes. if you're on we'll our private Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> we'll link to your Instagram yes. for the chicken waffles because you gave like a full report on that. It worked, but not in the way that we not anyone in the thought way at all. Or the way it was intended, I guess you could say. But like that's the example chicken and waffles crunch up supreme i mean like these are not recipes i'd be pulling out like when my kids were young or that i'd pull out for me and my husband but they taste good and they're getting him to like eat and he ate chicken in the morning fantastic when you could like barely get him to eat a bite of toast literally nothing yeah like he's he was like, just like oh, i'm fine yeah so Anyway. Yeah. And, and that's a great example of like the tasty plus nourishing. Like you found a way to get him some protein in a way that fit your like ethos around food, right? Like maybe yeah. you don't love frozen chicken nuggets, but if you can do the cauliflower ones and they'll eat them, that yeah. feels good for your family. Listen, I'm taking so many notes this week. <laughs> I can't make anything that Ella likes. Like all her favorites. She's just like, I'm tired of tortellini. I'm tired of burgers. <gasps> So I'm like, okay, the, we're making chicken. I'm making chicken noodle soup tonight because she promised she would eat that. Have a lasagna. <laughs> How about lasagna? <laughs> Chill. I, there's so much stuff I want to make, but that's another episode. That for another is another day episode. All for right. all the fall cooking. <laughs> right, right, all right. All the fall cooking. Okay, so this is like a really one of those times where we we need to hear from you because. Feeding teens is like this huge topic. Um, did we answer all of your burning questions? Did anything come up today that you want us to dig deeper into? Tell us by joining our community. Remember that you can visit show notes for this week's episode, the community page of our site or Instagram to find your way to both our free listeners group and our supporting membership, or find us on Instagram as at did and I just feed you and talk to us there. We can always send you a link in the DMs. Our newsletter is another great way to stay connected with us. You'll get notice of every new episode, sponsor promotions, and must have tip and product pick of the week every single week. Find the link to our newsletter sign up on our site or in our Instagram bio. And last but never least, don't forget to subscribe to Deny Just Feed You wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have a minute, leave us a review. Y'all have slowed down on this <laughs> and we're feeling kind of sad about it. <laughs> a huge thank you to our editor, Samantha Gatsik. I'm Stacy, And I'm Megan. Stay sane and well fed until next week. What is something you would never eat? I would never Take eat me. fish. I don't like fish.